Welcome to Chromaticus. Today we're going to look at the epic introduction to A Night on Bald Mountain, written by Mussorgsky and orchestrated by Rimsky-Korsakov. This is a great piece of music. It's so dark and evil sounding. The harmonic palette that he uses here is very unique. Let's take a listen first and then we'll break it down. As always, we are in score in C. Okay, the tempo marking, Allegro Feroce. Allegro means lively and fast, and Feroce means fierce or ferocious, so the players will dig in a little bit more aggressively when they see a marking like that. The opening statement begins with three textures. The first texture is this triplet ostinato pattern that he has in the violins one and two in octaves. This gives a really nice, dark, intense, but somewhat ambiguous sound, as there's no third or even a fifth of the scale being played. It could be Locrian Natural 7, it could be Neapolitan Minor, we don't really know without more information. But as you'll see in a minute, he's going to use that to his advantage. After the first two measures of that, the other two textures come in. The first one is this pedal tone in the flutes and the oboe, also in octaves. A pedal tone up high like that is sometimes called a wire, but it's the same effect as a pedal tone down in the bass. It sort of helps keep our ears grounded to a specific key center, in this case A. And the third texture is the bass line. Notice that the bass line notes are the same as the ostinato pattern, it's just a different rhythm. But it's still A, G sharp, and B flat. So he's sort of chromatically trapping that note A with a half step below and a half step above. And notice there's an A always on the downbeat. So he's really trying to make sure that our ears are hearing A as sort of the kind of grounded key center, even if the quality of the mode is somewhat ambiguous. So that pedal tone is in octaves in the upper woodwinds, the ostinato in octaves in the upper strings, and the bass line in three octaves. Okay, this is the A below middle C. So this is an octave down below, and the contrabass, remember, even in score and C, still reads down an octave. So the harmonic accompaniment that we're starting with is a fairly big sound. In measure five, he brings in the first melodic idea, which is this little kind of run in the woodwinds. Now the first part of the run with this E flat looks kind of like a Locrian natural seven. And then the second part of the run has a B natural and an E natural. Now he doesn't play the note F, so you could say it comes from harmonic minor or melodic minor. But either way, he's playing around with different modal qualities over top of the same harmonic information. That melodic line is played by the piccolo. We have two flutes, okay, that A2 marking means that both flutes reading this staff are playing this line together. So you have a piccolo, two flutes, we have two oboes, two clarinets, and two bassoons. The oboes, flutes, and piccolo play the line together. The clarinet plays the line with them the first time, but then there's this little subtle variation the second time where he holds this note over just a little bit longer and he skips that B. That's a really subtle difference there in the line, but interesting nonetheless. Okay, the bassoons are sort of playing these little accents, so he plays that first note A, but then he holds it against the other lines moving in the other woodwinds. So he holds that A steady, and then the E flat, he just plays one eighth note on that downbeat and drops out. So the bassoons are highlighting the A and the E flat, and then the A and the E natural here. This adds a really nice bit of variation down in that lower octave, rather than having every instrument play that melodic line the exact same way. Now notice that the violas also join in that melodic line with the woodwinds. So they're playing harmony in these two measures with the bass line, and then they join in the melodic line for two measures, and then they go back to playing the bass line. This is a sign of really good, really creative orchestration is taking an instrument, having it play, say, a bass line or some chords in the harmony, and then for like a measure or two or just to kind of tag the end of a line, they'll join in the melody. It really helps to keep things from getting too static. Underneath the melodic line, he's also got the horns and the timpani. He's got four horns playing that A in two octaves. So it's the same idea that the flute and the oboe played. It's just down one octave. And the timpani playing unmeasured tremolos underneath. Notice that the violins one and two changed up just a little bit during this little uh, woodwind run here. They're now just playing a tremolo back and forth between A and G sharp the whole time. So it's just kind of a little variation of that pattern there. 
and the cellos and the bass still playing that bass line, only now instead of the quarter notes with the staccato markings, which is really an eighth note followed by a rest, he's now got quarter notes that are all slurred together, so it's a little bit of a smoother, less plucky sounding bass line. Again, just that little bit of variation, little bit of changing in the lines, really helps keep the music from getting too static. It's very fluid, it's moving a lot, little things are changing. The ostinato pattern for four measures and then the variation. So you got the bass line for two measures and then the variation. The viola is two measures and then they completely switch roles. Okay, that pedal tone for two measures and then it changes down octaves and instruments for two measures. So there's a lot of little bits of variation that add up to make a really, really great orchestration. Let's listen to the runs in the woodwinds and the viola again. This time I want you to really listen to two key aspects. The first thing is that notice the crescendos here and the decrescendos making it louder and then softer. But if you notice, he's also using something called an orchestrated decrescendo. So the bassoons and the clarinets drop out here in this measure. The piccolos drop out here. One of the flutes and one of the oboes drop out here. And the other flute and the other oboe continue on for the full two measures. That's called an orchestrated decrescendo. So he's pairing back those instruments one at a time, making the texture uh, a little bit smaller each time, and therefore a little bit softer. An orchestrated decrescendo has a really nice effect rather than just using crescendo markings and decrescendo markings to make things louder or quieter. And the other thing to notice is that the second time he goes through the runs, they are a little bit different. So this time there's no E flat, there's an E natural, and there's also an F. So this has more of a Neapolitan minor sound. Remember this G sharps and the other string sections. And the second time he's got a B natural, an E natural, and an F sharp. So there he has more of a melodic minor sound. That's what's so cool about leaving things ambiguous in the harmony, is that you can play around with different melodic ideas in various modes, sort of superimpose over top of that basic harmonic foundation. In bar 12, the rhythm of the ostinato changes, and so does the implied harmony. Let's take a listen to this section again, and then we'll break it down. If you look at the harmony now in the woodwinds and in the string sections, it's essentially kind of this small F cluster of F, G sharp, and A. Now if we just play this chord steadily, it would sound like this. And it would be really, really dissonant. Now he obviously wants a nice dissonant sound, but maybe he didn't want it to be quite that dissonant, or he just wanted to be a little more creative with it, so he breaks it up into these little patterns. So instead of this, it sounds more like this. Playing it that way helps to ease that dissonance just a bit. If you do a pitch collection of this area, you end up with this, which looks like F Lydian sharp two. But he's not really using it in that way to give us that nice bright Lydian sound, hence all those tight clusters and that really dark ominous effect. In bar 17, he changes the cluster just a little bit with the notes A, B, and C. And in measures 18 and 19, he gives us an A sharp along with the A. And at this point, he's just getting more and more chromatic. He's probably just wanting to add more dissonance and probably not thinking too hard about a specific mode at this point. He's just looking for that nice chromatic sound. And then in bar 20, he goes back to that original F, G sharp, and A cluster. So this whole section is mostly in that F Lydian sharp two sound with the exception of those two measures in the middle where he adds that extra chromaticism. Now let's take a look at the orchestration. Our harmony is this ostinato pattern played by violins one and two, and it's backed up by the clarinets, the oboes, and the flutes. And the grand casa, which is the bass drum, is giving us a nice steady low end rumbling underneath which really helps to create that dark atmosphere, almost like thunder in the background. Now the sound of two string sections along with six woodwinds is a pretty large harmonic texture. So the melody is below the harmony, but that's why he has this massive orchestration to make that melody really stand out up front. He's also blending tone colors from the woodwinds, the string, and the brass sections. When you're orchestrating music, you should always be thinking about the tone color. So that melodic texture is in two bassoons in octaves. There's three trombones also in octaves. That third trombone doubling the second trombone here in the lower octave. He's also got the tuba, the viola, the cellos, and the contrabass all playing that melodic line. And remember that contrabass is still playing down one octave from this 
which means the strings are also in three separate octaves. So this is a very loud, powerful melody that stands out up front. <laughs> In measure 21, he has these little triplet ideas. And then again in measure 23, going into these big chords. The triplet ideas are really just the interval C and D, a dissonant major second spread out across the orchestra. And he also adds in the rest of the brass playing that note D in octaves, as well as the timpani also playing the note D. And the timpani is playing an unmeasured tremolo, which is those three slashes above the note, just means to play back and forth really, really fast. And notice before he gets to these big chords, the two measures before is where he adds in the timpani and the rest of the brass, the trumpets and the horns. The trumpets and the horns were resting the entire time, and so was the timpani. So that really helps these two measures here start to build and swell into these big chords coming up in measure 24. So he's not adding any new information, not new melody notes or new chords. He's just adding more instruments. And that's what leads us into measures 24 and 25, where we have these gigantic orchestrated chords. This type of texture is called a tutti. It's a unified idea where all the instruments play the same rhythm. So essentially a giant orchestral chord. If we do a reduction of these chords, it's a little easier to see how it's laid out across the orchestra. There's a few things I want to point out when you're orchestrating these large chords that are really important. If you look at the bass note of the chord, we have a string section, a brass instrument, and a woodwind instrument. So he's a member of each family of the orchestra playing that bass note. The bass notes doubled an octave above, and you see the same thing, a member of the string family, the brass family, and the woodwind family. So not only is the bass note really strong, but it's also spread out across the different sections of the orchestra. If you look at the string sections, they're spread out throughout the entire chord from top to bottom. So the string sections don't play every single note, but they do play throughout the whole range from the highest note with the violins all the way down to the contrabass on the lower note. If you look at the woodwinds though, the bassoons are playing the low notes and the rest of the woodwinds are playing up high in the treble clef. So even though there's no woodwinds in the middle of the chord, you do have the French horns sort of filling in that gap and bridging the low woodwinds with the high woodwinds. Because this chord is only an eighth note, it's a short, kind of sharp, punctuated chord. You also have the timpani in the middle here on that D, and you have the grand casa and the piatti, which give it that nice, sharp, percussive sound. Notice in the violins one and two, he has double stops in the first chord, and then quadruple stops in the second chord. In order to play all those notes together on a string instrument, you have to pull the bow across the strings really fast, which means you can't play slow passages like half notes or whole notes, but it's great for short punctuated chords like this one. With those triple and quadruple stops, you get a lot of nice power from the string section. Now these two chords, the first one might kind of look like a G minor over a B flat. However, the second time he adds the note E, which gives us a tritone between E and B flat, and tritones inevitably suggest a dominant chord even if there's no C in this chord. Remember, we did just hear a ton of that note C right in here. And our ears have sort of that backward memory where you can kind of hear things in relation to something that just happened right before it. So I would say that the overall sound of these chords is a rootless C dominant seven chord, which keeps up with the overall thematic idea of creating lots of dissonance. Let's listen to these chords one more time before we move on to the next section. And we'll start in bar 22 where that brass and the timpani comes in. And then we'll just listen all the way through the next section. There are two older notational standards that I need to point out. The first one is these triplets here. So he wrote a quarter note with a slash through it, meaning play eighth notes. And then he wrote a three above it, meaning play triplet eighth notes. If you imagine having to write all this out by hand, this is a lot easier. But today with computers and everything, you would just write it out as triplets instead of using this older notational standard. And the other one is in the horns in F. Now we're reading in score in C, so this is actually what's being played. But if you're reading the actual score, especially if it's an older score, horns in F in the bass clef actually transpose up a fourth. And when they're written in the treble clef, they transpose down a fifth. So if you're looking at an older score, that's something to be aware of. Now the contrabass plays this nice steady D pedal tone for the first couple of measures. The cello does a little variation on that an octave above, 
where they're playing a D and a C sharp tremolo back and forth. C sharp being that leading tone tonicizing D. The timpani's also playing that tremolo D pedal tone. And the horns are playing that D in octaves. If you do a pitch collection of this section, it looks like this. So I would say this whole section's in D chromatic. The chromatic scale is great for the mood that he was trying to portray. An apparition of the spirit of darkness. In other words, an evil unleashed upon the world. This piece should give you a great bit of insight into composing really dark and haunting music. Notice that there are no traditional chord progressions. The harmonic and melodic writing is very dissonant and there's a lot of chromaticism. Above that pedal tone, we have this very angular downward moving line played in the upper string sections as well as the entire woodwind section. The piccolos and the flutes playing in the first half and then switching off to the oboes and the bassoons in the second half. These are essentially just moving chords, but the lower part is playing quarter notes. The upper part in the strings is playing triplet eighth notes. And then the upper part in the flutes, which is the same notes, is just playing a different rhythm. They're playing steady eighth notes. Since there's three different variations of the rhythm going on, they're kind of rhythmically rubbing up against each other, which is a really interesting sound. Let's take a closer look at this sort of angular melodic line. Remember, this is all over a D pedal tone in the bass, with the cellos playing a tremolo of D and C sharp. <laughs> Okay, the first chord is D and F sharp, basically a D major chord with no fifth. The next chord is an A minor triad, then back to that D major sort of dyad. This next one is pretty strange. He has a B flat, D and F natural makes a B flat major triad. But notice in the violins, instead of a B flat up high, he has an A sharp. Now you might think A sharp is enharmonic spelling of B flat, so they're the same note. But that would really only apply to an instrument like the piano, where you have a set tuning. String instruments can play a quarter sharp or a quarter flat or even an eighth sharp or an eighth flat. So by writing an A sharp instead of a B flat, the violins one might play that note just a pinch sharper and the violins two might play that B flat just a pinch flatter, just creating even a little bit more dissonance than there otherwise would be. And we're back to that D major dyad, the A minor. Here we have a B natural. So this is more of a B minor dyad and then an F sharp minor. And then he starts repeating in the lower octave. So he's moving around between different triads and dyads over top of that D pedal tone. And remember the cellos have that C sharp in there, so it's going to be somewhat of a dissonant rub against the note D. Again, keeping up with that thematic idea of creating lots of dissonance and almost making it sound uh, uncomfortable or uh, unsettling. In the last two bars, he's essentially doing the same thing. He just goes about it a little bit differently with the bassoons and the clarinets. The pedal tone stops, and then he has this line that's essentially just harmonized in thirds. So you have D and F sharp. It moves up to E flat and G, then moving up to F sharp and A, then to G and B flat, and back down to the F sharp and the A. So it's a really similar idea with these moving chords, only here it's a little more fluid and linear, as opposed to the first half, which had a lot more large skips and kind of angular motion. Now notice the orchestration here. He has two measures of flute and piccolo, and then they're dovetailed over the bar line, moving into oboes and bassoons. So he's keeping that line moving between different parts of the woodwind section, which means that the tone color is changing. Switching between different tone colors throughout one line gives a really nice evolving sound to the music. That dovetailing is really important if you want a smooth connection between those lines. In measure 30 and 31, there's a really cool orchestrated crescendo in the bassoons, violas, and clarinets. The bassoons playing this line along with the violas. Now notice that there's a crescendo marking and then a decrescendo. Now with that crescendo and decrescendo, he's also adding in the clarinets and then he's taking them away. So it's a nice little orchestrated crescendo and orchestrated decrescendo with those clarinets. This is one of the many little subtle things that makes for really great orchestration. Measure 32 through 35 have these nice big orchestrated chords again. We have these chromatically ascending bass notes and then some dyads and one triad above with these really nice grace notes pulling us into the chords and the downbeats. Hey, the piatti is present for all three chords, but the timpani, the bass drum, the tuba and all the trombones, as well as two trumpets, are only present on that last chord, which gives it a really nice big final sound. Using that extra brass along with the percussion in this way is very common. Now this last chord here is really fascinating because it's pretty much just two notes, A and E, which is a perfect fifth interval, which is a very open, clear, and consonant sound. But then he adds all these little half-step trills in the woodwind section from A to B flat. And that takes that consonant sound and makes it really dissonant. Also the trombones and the tuba 
as well as the percussion and all the string section only play on that one downbeat and then they stop. So it's a really aggressive punctuated sound. And what carries on after that is the upper brass and the woodwinds. So you get this really nice full sound on the downbeat and then it thins out for the rest of that measure. Although with the bassoons and the horns, it's still a pretty full sound. It's not like it gets really thin, but the whole string section is used just for the accent on that downbeat. Notice the horns are also doubled up, so you have four horns, but they're only playing two notes. That's because in a forte or louder dynamic, you need two horns for every one trumpet. And because you have two trumpet notes here, if you want the horns to balance with the trumpets, you need to double up on your horns. So two horns play one note, and two horns play the other note. And this little symbol over the rest at the end is a fermata, which means to hold or pause until cued in by the conductor. So that can apply to rests or a sustained note. Let's listen to the sound of these chords one final time. Today's quote comes from Michelangelo, the artist, not the turtle. If people only knew how hard I work to gain my mastery, it wouldn't seem so wonderful at all. I like to think about this whenever I'm in a rut, because even one of the greatest artists in history still had to work ridiculously hard to gain that level of mastery. It didn't just come out of nowhere, as people always seem to think it does. With that in mind, remember to keep studying, keep practicing, and keep growing. See you next time.